let's go ahead and start with the spy. So we've been watching spy start to create yet another topping pattern in its chart for the last. Mm, I'm gonna I'm gonna safely say it's been two weeks, and I think at this point it's safe to say that spy is expressing some definitive weakness. The MACD on the daily has been squarely in bearish territory, pushing the downside and still spreading further away from the slow MACD line. Um, what that means for everybody who's uh, watching in YouTube land after the fact is we have these two lines on MACD that express the momentum of the stock. The blue line is called the, quote, fast line, and the orange is the, quote, slow line. They're just short versus long moving averages. And when you see these crossovers, that's when you see a change in momentum. So notice that right here we had a crossover and the stock had a brief dip. That usually is a sign of weakness. And then we had another crossover right before this dip. And then we've had yet another. It was actually a rejection on the MACD. And this happened just as the market had come off of a top. So we hit our top with this particular, what we'll call a doji candle. This is a doji indecision candle, this red one right here. And the MACD rejected, meaning that the fast line never crossed and started moving down. So it never crossed the slow line to the upside, and it just started rejecting. That's a loss of momentum, clearly bearish. So unless the market turns around with some fundamentally very bullish catalysts, this doesn't look good. Right now, the market has created several bearish signs that tell us that we have hit a top and we need to be extremely careful of going into long positions. I'm not going to be taking any long positions until there's a fundamental catalyst that turns the market around. Right now, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of markets that are pushing. Uh, I'm sorry, market um, media sources that are pushing all this you know news and garbage about how the market has turned and the Fed's going to pivot and now everything's going to be great again. But there's no basis for that. At best, we are expecting the Fed to slow their rate hikes. We are not expecting them to start pivoting, as in lowering interest rates for at least a year. So that's not happening. The Fed's been very clear about it. And even though everybody wants to bash the credibility of the Fed, they've not they they've still stood by their charter to try to fight inflation. That is their primary directive. So looking at the chart, there's several things that we need to pay attention to. One thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in a 200 daily SMA. All of these trends you see here, the white, blue, green, orange, red, these are exponential moving averages. They're highly reactive. And what I notice is that the market, whenever it has crossed above since we've entered this bear market as of January through March, this is when we entered the bear market. Ever since that point, whenever we crossed above this EMA, the weakness happened on a descending line of resistance. And this has remained true three times now. Now, the last two times that this happened, once on March 30th and once again on August the 16th, the market entered into a severe downtrend. This created this bearish megaphone pattern, which is the white broadening lines that you see here. What this has created is descending resistance and a ever-growing lower low potential for the stock market. Now, at this point, I don't necessarily believe that the market will for sure reach this point, but this is well within the calculated possibility that I've accounted for since this mar bear market began. And I drew these lines in, I want to say May, maybe late April, and it's been consistently true. And the fact that we have hit this top perfectly three times now really speaks to the accuracy of this pattern. And I don't think that we should ignore this. The other thing that I notice is that the last time that we tagged this uh, megaphone pattern, we touched the very tippy top of the 200 day simple moving average. That's this line that I just added right here. That's exactly where it hit, and it rejected it very harshly. Now, because of this 
big move to the downside. We dragged our 200 day simple moving average pretty far below. And now we've only just barely gotten above it and we've already rejected. We're trading back below it again. So this is likely signaling big continuation to the downside. So we're likely in for our next season of selling. And I want to put this out here to warn not only the demons, but the entirety of Hell's Trading Floor and the whole stock market, anybody that will listen, that news stories of a Fed pivot and that the market is turning, in my very humble opinion, is just a bid to get retail investors to give up exit liquidity to the institution so that they can start running the market with their next round of selling. And there will be a major sell-off. Now, if I take these trend patterns for the downside, I imagine that we are going to, at the very least, retest this low in the market. So at the very least, I expect to retest 355, I'm going to say, or 356. We tagged 346 on the day that CPI data got released back in uh, back on the 13th of October, and then we started this bull rally kind of out of nowhere. But now that we've had this run, the exhaustion is kicking in, and we're about to start seeing the market turn around. Uh, one of the signs that gave us that was a ascending wedge that showed up in the RSI. It appeared here in the RSI as well, and now we've finally broken it. Additionally, head and shoulders on the MACD. This is not traditional technical analysis, but what I notice is that the MACD had this big bounce, big strength, and it kept pushing. But after the final rejection right here, very specifically right here, the MACD never crossed. It just rejected the slow line and then started moving down. That was the beginning of the end for the market there. Well, we just had that move again. We had a topping pattern where we had this big push of strength and the MACD reflects it kind of like a double top pattern, right? And this is what the market did between those two tops. And this last top, the MACD had a greatly lower high and it never crossed over to the upside. So this to me reads of big downside momentum. And that's not the only pattern that this has formed. On top of this being in a expanding megaphone, on top of the MACD being extremely bearish, on top of the ascending wedge of the RSI, there's also this giant ascending wedge for the market here. And we had this exact same pattern turn up in the market right here. Big ascending wedge with a brief breakout to the upside before breaking down harshly. And that happened in uh, August after the June and July rally. So the expectation would be for this to play out pretty much exactly the same. So again, this is just, th these, are my, these are my opinions and a very, very ardent warning to everybody to please be careful. I want to get to the finance sector because uh, Tipped asked for that. But before I do that, I'm going to quickly cover the VIX um, for Grilled Rockfish. He couldn't be here today, but um, the VIX is starting to show signs of strength, which really does, this does agree with my, um, with my crash thesis. I believe that we will be coming back down in the market, and we're starting to see that, that sign of strength from the VIX. So VIX bull flagged big time. This big move right here is absolutely enough to convince me that we're, we're due for another move to the downside in the market. VIX is pumping like crazy. And now it's just below, just below its 200 period, two hour moving average. So measured move for this is on a breakout would be for this to take another leg, the length of its flagpole. That's 20, that puts it above 27 at a minimum above 26. But for me, I think the VIX is easily going to cross above its trend line now. The VIX has been, uh, the VIX was creating this descending level of resistance over the last, uh, well, basically since the bear market really got started. Um, this was the worst of it in January when we had that first big dump and everybody started hedging with puts and selling calls like crazy. The VIX went crazy when that happened. And that is starting to happen again, but we haven't had a move quite like that. We didn't have that huge, like, you know, that parabolic move to the same degree since the COVID pandemic, actually. So all of these big moves to the upside have been like really slow burners. 
but we did cross and closed several candles on the daily chart above that trend line right here. We had two evening stars back to back here, and we had uh, we had this one candle that crossed but didn't close, and then we gapped up the next day in September. So these peaks in the VIX, I believe we will cross these by the time the VIX peaks again. And we will probably see something on par with the January move in the VIX. I believe that this time, based on where it's currently trading, the VIX is way oversold for one. This is the lowest its RSI has been, even lower than in January when we started to get the rumblings that the Fed was going to be tapering. So this consolidation in the RSI for the VIX is a huge sign of a big windup. The MACD did the same thing. Big windup. Lots of consolidation down here while the VIX was pushing the downside. And now it's being held here below 23. And remember, I said that if the VIX touches 19, that's the springboard. That's when the VIX is going to come back very quickly. And it did. Like, pretty sure it hit exactly 19 and then it bounced immediately. What was this low? The low was 1895. That's that's as close to perfect as you can predict something hitting before it bounces. So the VIX hit $19 and sprang immediately for a week. That's a big sign. So right now, the greed is starting to flow out of the market and fear is coming back. Now we're going to start seeing the terror in the market resume. I'm pretty sure that the Fed is going to leap on the opportunity to talk down the market even further because this will be another uh, this will be another opportunity for them to fight inflation again. That's how they're going to see it. Let's take a look at the uh, market breadth indicator. Everybody, this is Numscully's chart. Um, as he mentioned, the red line is the 200 EMA, the white is the 200 SMA. And what this market indicator is telling you is essentially this is a estimate of the stock, the number of stocks in the S&P that are trading above or below its 200 daily moving average. When this indicator is trading below its own 200 daily moving average, that's basically a sign that you're in a bear market. Most um, most institutions look at this as a indication of overall market sentiment over the long term. And we've been trading below the 200 moving average on this particular chart for a long time. What I want to draw your attention to is this area right here where the entire market, oh, I'm sorry, you guys can't see this. Let me go ahead and change windows really quickly and then we'll switch back. But uh, this this candle right here where the market peaked above that 200 EMA and SMA and then immediately rejected, that actually happens at the peak of every, uh, That that's happened at the peak of every bear market rally we've had since January. So we haven't quite reached the uh, the 200 SMA and EMA in the past, but this is the lowest we've gotten in the market and there's been enough time for it to reject. And now we can clearly see where that 200 EMA and SMA are sitting at and they're crossing to, they're crossing together for one. This is uh, this is essentially a sign of a turnaround in the market. So this this candle right here is significant, and the, con the confirmation candles that follow are equally significant. I'll go ahead and switch back over to my trading view charts, and then we'll go take a look at the, uh, the SPY and the HYG ratio chart. So SPY and HYG ratio chart are showing lower highs on price, on MACD, and notice that these peaks happen April 11th. April 22nd, or August 22nd, November 22nd. These are all peak points in the market. These are like right before, right before the market peaked. I think one exception here is August 22nd because the market was so hot that it peaked a few days earlier and the MACD momentum was still going. So just because the momentum was so strong, this one lagged a bit. But in any case, MACD is turning around right here. So we're due for we're due for a push down. I'll go ahead and add spy to this. So you can see these tops right here. Here's the here's the MACD crossover. This is the spy. First MACD crossover right there. Here is the second MACD crossover right here. And this is the 
last MACD crossover we had in September. This is on a weekly chart, by the way. Not a daily chart. This is a weekly chart. So this one lags quite a bit, but you can you can see the peaks much more easily, and you can see the peaks happen a bit earlier. They give you a few days lead time. So here we had this one. This peak happened right here, the week that it peaked. And now we're it looks like we're peaking now. Now I'll move on to the financial sector. That's the XLF, the uh, S and P Select Fund for finance sector. Interestingly enough, this one follows the SPY the closest. This is definitely a ticker to pay attention to for what banks are, uh, what banks' performance are. And as you can see, we had a bullish divergence on the weekly that predicted this big market rally that the banks had. Now the banks' dividends have hit, most of them anyway. Um, Bank of America had their dividend hit. I think the JP Morgan's may have already hit. Let me go ahead and pull that up just to be sure that I'm not. Okay, their dividend their dividend already passed a while back. So JP Morgan is due for a dividend at some point near its earnings to occur in December or January. When do they usually pay out their dividend? Okay, so they pay out their dividend in the first week of January. So after JP Morgan's dividend, I would definitely anticipate a big sell-off in their stock. The finance sector did really, 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 really well. Bank of America, I'll go ahead and show you their chart, what they did after their dividend. This is what Bank of America did after their dividend hit. And uh, Persephone, I think that you had a really banger play on this one, uh, getting puts near the top right before their dividend. I heard... It was a I, little late. I got it the day... I got it on the record day or record day. Okay. So then, well, in either case, still great play, good eye, excellent targeting. The setup for this one was a little bit uh a little bit uncertain. I think that people thought that uh market conditions were going to be a little bit more kind to the banks and seems they were dead wrong. Bank of America is one of the leaders. They actually are it appears to me getting the most punishment right now after their dividend. They put in a higher high on their MACD, but their crossover happened much quicker on the daily. They lost momentum so fast. It was it was interesting. It's like it, it was like a perfect hump in the market and then it just fell off a cliff. It's very unusual. Normally it's more it's more choppy, you know, it'll do like Elliott waves to get to the top and then you'll get the head and shoulders. Kind of like this did. It went up and up and eh, okay, now we're done. It was a much more gradual drop. This one was just straight to the moon, weaken out, flatten out, and then fall over the other side of the uh, over the other side of the cliff. So this is already played out for Bank of America. That ship has sailed. But you can look at uh, Goldman Sachs. Their dividend also disastrous. They took a shot to the downside big time. This is one that we can take advantage of too. Uh, Lending Club Corporation. This one is a mortgage lender. Um, so that one may not be the one to play. Morgan Stanley is pretty high up in its chart. They only just recently put in a double top on their RSI and then hit to the downside. They're now getting a nice bear flag bounce. So this one, this one looks really good for a short. This looks really good for a short. I think Morgan Stanley is honestly a really terrible finance firm. They have some of the biggest losses in history in the stock market, especially in bear markets. I don't know if it's just the way they do business or if they just have bad luck with their traders on their trading desk or if they just take more risks than others and end up with you know, a bag holder culture. I don't know what it is. But Morgan Stanley has historically been one of the worst performers in bear markets especially since 2008, they hold the record for the most money lost in a single day in the stock market because one trader sold a whole bunch of single A credit default swaps. Well, credit default swaps on single A mortgage-backed securities, which are supposed to be really good. They sold the credit default swaps against those in order to buy credit default swaps on triple B and double B mortgage-backed securities, but as it turns out, all of the mortgages failed. 
And Morgan Stanley's payout for the double Bs didn't even cover 5% of their losses from the fallout from their single A credit default swaps. Because those are much, they pay out much, much bigger when they fail. I can't remember the trader's name, but he's famous on Wall Street for being the biggest loser on the market because of that trading decision. He got, he got reamed. The guy's career was just destroyed. Mm. You could probably go to like the 2008 financial crisis and read about the Morgan Stanley uh, trade that was such a disaster. And it was announced right after Bank of America had bought them. So (laughs) that was a big, yeah, the Bank of America acquisition on Morgan Stanley. And then Morgan Stanley announced that big loss. It was the biggest loss in Wall Street history. Let's uh, let's look at the rest of the uh, XLF sector. So overall, the fund for XLF does look, it's definitely in bearish territory. We've got a perfect triple top right here. We have one big volatile spike that took it through. But if you go to this on the daily, I think you can easily see that we, we have topped on this one. So the MACD has been putting in lower highs ever since it's been in this trend. That's a divergence, definitely. And it, the MACD on the daily rejected a crossover here. So this last push was the top for this one. Now, there are a few other candles to pay attention to on the daily. We've had we've actually had two gravestone candles and one indecision doji to me this looks like the market is uh just kind of wavering on support from its 200 period daily ema so this is a nice strong level of support but once it breaks it there's gaps in the chart that take it all the way back down to its previous high right here so i'm seeing support at around 2350 for the finance sector 20, 20 or 2260 2260 2250 thereabouts so there could be a big opportunity for a short to continue trading uh finance markets to the downside but i kind of think that a better way to go about it is to look for the banks that haven't paid their dividends yet cuz this is going to be their last big dividend the banks are pushing this huge dividend as an incentive for shareholders to continue providing them with liquidity. And I think this is going to be the last one. It's a late stage crash thing that has been going on since the dot-com bust. But banks have this playbook now where they put out a, they increase their dividend. And then about six to 12 months later, then the market dumps on them. And after each dividend, the dumps get worse and worse and worse. So this last, because the investors are losing faith in the bank altogether, and they just want the dividend payout. Um, I need their money back. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of how I see it. Um, The banks providing the liquidity are trying to entice real uh, retail investors to be the buyers. And ultimately, I feel like it's exit liquidity for their own investors. A lot of banks sell their own stock going into these um, going into these dividends because they know that they're going to lose going forward. Mm. One of the um, one of the other commodities or assets that I was thinking of is like lithium. I was curious about the value of lithium futures. I wonder if I could get this up here. Yeah, lithium is going crazy. Like lithium has been been roaring since January. It's the, one of the commodities that's been in such short supply that it's just gone nuts and I think that's going to continue because it's still it's still considered a rare earth element. Lithium's not very common and you need quite a bit of it to create the lithium ion batteries. There's only a few places in the world where lithium mines are plentiful enough that you can get this stuff. 
the problem is, is that in order to trade it, you need to trade like these, these crazy expensive futures contracts. And I know that that's like, that's well beyond the scope of what anyone, or at least most people in hell's trading floor can trade or, or the retail market, but you can target other companies that are, you know, going to be the source of lithium. I didn't put it in my L I T M L I T M. Thank you. Snow Lake Resources. This is one of the companies that I was paying close attention to. They got pushed down pretty badly, and now I think they're way undervalued. I wanted to bet long on this when the market started to squeeze because lithium sources, these guys don't have a whole lot of debt. Their mining operation is still being spun up, but they're going to be putting out raw material lithium pretty soon. They have mining rights. In a few different locations, they have a stake claim on some lithium-rich mines, and lithium is an absolute necessity for our society now with you know lithium-ion batteries. So this is like a really super, super cheap company, and for whatever reason, their stock has just been getting dumped on, but they have a lot of really hidden value. If they even get their operation running a year from now, it still wouldn't be enough lithium to satisfy the demand for the world. Like the expense of lithium is insane. And the mining equipment they need is no different than the same mining equipment you need for digging for gold or diamonds or anything like that. It's the same it's the same stuff. And they have most of it already. So this is one to watch. This is one to watch for for sure. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what the next opportunity for like a lithium squeeze is and seeing what company is going to be like the biggest producer that coming out of it i got to do some more research on this one but this is a commodity for everybody to keep an eye on thank you guys so much for tuning in to watch this video if you enjoyed the content and you found this information helpful to you and your own trading strategies be sure to leave a like on the video it helps out the youtube algorithm and helps us reach out to others who need this information too be sure to subscribe if you want to see more and if you're not a member of hell's trading floor already Consider joining our Discord by joining us at hellstradingfloor.com, which will allow you to sign up for our Discord at discord.gg slash hellstradingfloor. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Until then, have a hell of a time in the markets.